वेलकम टू द सेकंड एपिसोड ऑफ सीजन टू ऑफ द थिंक वाइल्ड एप पॉडकास्ट इन दिस एपिसोड वी स्पीक टू अनीश अंधेरिया ही इज अ फेमस कंजर्वेशनिस्ट फ्रॉम इंडिया एंड इज करेंटली द प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ द वाइल्ड लाइफ कंजर्वेशन ट्रस्ट वी स्पीक ओवर वेरियस रेंज ऑफ इश्यूज रिगार्डिंग कंजर्वेशन इन इंडिया विद अ पर्टिकुलर इंटरेस्ट इन टाइगर कंजर्वेशन ओ वेलकम टू आवर पॉडकास्ट माय प्लेजर माय प्लेजर टू बी हियर so india has doubled her tiger population in the last 12 years what have we done well as a country to achieve this feat so yeah india has achieved what was thought to be impossible in fact uh, in the late 1990s people or early 1990s people believed that tigers won't see the turn of the century and now we are in 2023 and india has over 3000 tigers i'm sure because we are awaiting the results from the 2022 four year tiger estimation so as per the 2018 estimation india had dub- more than doubled the tiger numbers since the first scientific estimation was done in 2006 so in about uh, i would say a 12 year old 12 year cycle uh, we were able to uh, double more than double the tiger numbers so it's a extremely a uh, uh, praiseworthy feat by the state governments by the ntca uh, especially on the back of uh, that phase when uh, tigers in panna and sariska went extinct uh, that was towards the i mean around 2005 to 2007 8 there were a spate of uh, poaching incidences some of the top tiger reserves lost a lot of tigers and in 2006 is when uh, ntca was formed and uh, since then a lot of efforts have gone in and yeah india has uh, more than doubled which is quite a fascinating feat um, there are several ways in which uh, we can look at it one is that um, the patrolling became far more s- systematic there were vacancies uh, staff vacancies that were filled up in some of these better governed states i'm not saying this is all across india but uh, at least in the better governed state uh, states the uh, the staff vacancies were filled uh, new positions were uh, formed there was an institution of uh, uh, they they introduced what is called stpfs uh, that is special tiger protection force uh, maharashtra madhya pradesh uh, uh and karnataka they are the states that benefited from it because they have these stpf uh, uh, in their states when tigers in all these three states have definitely gone up in a big way um communities were uh kind of far more in, are now are far more integrated in conservation uh, there are eco development committees there are joint forest management committees Uh, eco development committees within tiger reserves and joint forest committee management committees in the corridors where government puts in some um, seed money um, and the, the 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 villagers participate in uh, activities which are pro conservation um, uh, definitely protection mechanisms have been strengthened uh, incentives for uh, people have gone up through various government programs uh, there have been initiatives in different states to uh, wean people off their dependence on forests that means livelihood programs have come up and people have uh, been encouraged have encouraged have been encouraged to move away from a forest dependent livelihoods to something which is um, you know far more uh, which has very little negative impact on the forest uh, definitely uh i would say a very important other role is in uh, mitigating conflict government are giving compensation for for cattle kills even injury to cattle because of large carnivores especially tiger are compensated uh, even her, uh, uh, herbivores that come and destroy so there is a lot of uh, interact interface between farmers and pigs spotted deer and other species herbivores uh, when such animals come in and raid crops uh, the damage to the crops is assessed 
and some amount of compensation is given. I'm not saying it's enough. Uh, it's very difficult to measure the damage on crop fields. It's not as easy as uh, a cattle kill because cattle, you know, you can see the animal, you know, it's, uh, uh, you can uh, age the animal. You would also know the quality of the animal, the breed. Based on that, the government gives uh, compensation. Obviously, compensation is not exactly, uh, uh, you know, it's about, I, do, I would say, 40 to 50 percent of the actual cost of that cattle. Uh, but all that has really, uh, in a way, allowed the tigers to survive outside protected areas. Inside, the protection has improved and outside community partners, partnerships have, have ensured that tigers are allowed to move in the corridors. And all those put together, I think, has been the, the kind of a, a big turnaround for tigers, especially in India. And the world needs to look at what has happened in India and try to follow uh, the strategy if they want to bring the tiger back from the brink. And when I say the world, uh, I'm talking about the 13 tiger range countries. India is one of the 13 tiger range countries and it has nearly 75% of all wild tigers. The remaining 12 countries um, have uh, less than 25% uh, and so those countries need to look at uh, those strategies that were deployed in India uh, and try to emulate them. Uh, Nepal and Bhutan are other two countries where tiger populations have gone up. Nepal had close to 150 tigers. Now they're talking about nearly 200, 340 tigers uh, during the same period that India saw the rise. Even Bhutan, the population is stable. Uh, in Bhutan, in fact, 70% uh, of the country is forested. So uh, tigers have done well in these three countries. India, because has about India has 350,000 square kilometers of tiger habitat, and therefore it is much, much, much larger than Bhutan and Nepal. And so, obviously, its contribution to the global tiger population is significant. So, in the current situation, what do you think is the way forward for tiger conservation in India? So, India has uh, already, uh, as I just mentioned, has done uh, commendable work to, to bring back uh, tigers in areas where tigers had actually got locally extinct in many of the parks, and they are now all back. Um, however, one must understand that uh, there are 18 states in India that boasts of tigers. Of this, my understanding is that about seven or eight of those states are actually contributing to this rise in population. Uh, the remaining 10 states have near, not really contributed uh, to this rise. In fact, uh, places like West Bengal, which has a tiger reserve called Baksa, um, Northeast Arunachal Pradesh, uh, there is Namdapha Tiger Reserve, then there is Dampa Tiger Reserve in Mizoram, um, there are other smaller tiger reserves in Assam, like Namiri. Um, there are uh, tiger reserves in Chhattisgarh, in Bihar. There's Valmiki. In uh, uh, there is Palamu as well. Uh, then there are tiger reserves like Sarkosia and uh, Simlipal in Odisha. So these tiger reserves really don't have stable tiger populations. In fact, some of these tiger reserves don't even have. Tigers, like the Kaval Tiger Reserve of Telangana, uh, not many tigers that whatever they have are all dispersing tigers from southern Maharashtra, that is Vidarbha region. So uh, the challenges in front of these are not well, uh, states which are not well performing are many. Uh, primarily their habitats are there, but there is too much of pressure from communities, there is too much of grazing. Uh, there is dependence on the community in form of uh, fuel wood, minor forest produced on these forests. Um, and as a result, prey populations is very, very low. As a result, tiger population is not good. Uh, and so India, while it is, uh, if you look at the bigger picture, obviously India has done well. But most of these tigers have come in from Uttarakhand, uh, parts of Assam, Madhya Pradesh, Karnataka, Maharashtra, uh, to a certain extent from Tamil Nadu and Kerala, although the habitat in Tamil Nadu and Kerala is not a typical uh, tiger habitat, which means it's an evergreen forest. And as a result, the tiger populations can never be uh, of the same density as uh, Karnataka and Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra. So these are the states that I would say have done well as far as tiger conservation goes, but the remaining 10 states are have to... Uh, you know, really work very, very hard 
to bring the tiger back uh, another challenge is of course of development there is huge amount of uh, linear infrastructure that is being built in india nearly 23 kilometers of uh, highway is being built every single day and the government wants to reach uh, a pace of about 44 kilometers a day and if that happens a lot of highway and a lot of railways are going to be built in india um, and when that happens obviously uh, some of those will impinge upon the existing corridors and so uh, the challenge would be to see how conservation and development can go hand in hand which means in the urge to develop uh, india as a country should not destroy the existing vital corridors between tiger habitats already tigers as i told you are under tremendous pressure in those 10 states and if in those states development happens haphazardly or in a way where they don't really take care of the existing ecosystems, you may be able to reach a place where we will not be able to uh, recover uh, the tiger population. So, so linear devel uh, infrastructure development per se, dams, mines uh, are a big threat to uh, not only tigers, but several other species, large and small elephants, uh, all the large ranging species even very many bird species are going to get hampered because of it. So as we move forward, India will have to embark upon, a, 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 you know, basically greener technologies, technologies and development trajectories, which uh, take into consideration the welfare of wild animals in the forest. So these two challenges. And third, of course, is of uh, human wildlife conflict. Uh, because of the increase in populations in those seven, eight states, uh, there has been a rise in interface or interaction between people and large carnivores. Tiger population cannot go up in isolation. So as, as the government put in efforts to increase tiger numbers, uh, obviously leopard numbers also went up and several other species like the deer population also went up. As a result, the interaction between wild animals and people has gone up. Uh, and there has been tremendous amount of loss uh, incurred by poor farmers, also deaths because of uh, tigers. Uh, in fact, India probably loses about 100 to 110 people every year because of tiger attacks. Um, they also lose uh, equivalent number of people because of leopard attacks. And there are many injured people because of leopards as well. So that, again, is a big challenge. One will have to see how uh, people's dependence on the forest can go down because this interface is largely because uh, poorest of the poor people have to go to the forest uh, to collect fuel wood for what is called firewood for cooking and for heating water and also to uh, for minor forest produce. So the government will have to come up with uh, livelihood programs that percolate down to the, to the most remotest villages. Um, so which wherein people's income come from uh, professions that are not impinging upon natural ecosystems. So it's a Herculean task. We are millions of, India has 1.4 billion people. Of this, nearly 300 million people are directly dependent on uh, forest resources. Uh, up to about 40% of the subsistence comes from the forest. There are several communities who are entirely dependent on the forest. So uh, if the government wants to sustain uh, wildlife and forests, Going forward, they'll have to have very, very robust programs to improve the livelihoods of the poorest of the poor in the places they live. The solution is not to send them to cities because life in cities, as we know, as we have seen in during COVID, is horrible for uh, of, of people who don't belong to those cities. And so, the ideal formula would be to improve their livelihood options right where they live. And if you have happy, prosperous communities. Uh, then the forest will remain intact. What has been the greater conservation impact of Project Tiger beyond simply increasing tiger populations? Question, Project Tiger is now called NTCA. Yeah. And as I told you, the protection has gone up. Um, uh, every single tiger death is considered as a poaching case unless it is proven uh, otherwise. Uh, there is uh, always a thrust to increase the number of tiger reserves uh, India now has 53 tiger reserves. When T Project Tiger was launched in 1972, there were nine tiger reserves only. And now 
uh, almost 50 years. This is the 50th year. Next is is the 50th year of Project Tiger. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, India has 53 Tiger Reserves. Together, about 2.3% of India is under uh, Project Tiger, basically under the Tiger Reserve umbrella. Um, they have also, as I said, improved protection through filling up seats, uh, filling up vacancies, increase the number of positions uh, in certain tiger reserves. There is a thrust to uh, wean off people from their dependence on the forest through livelihood programs in the corridor. Corridors are much better managed now than they used to be 20 years ago. A lot needs to be done. I'm not saying they have the answers to all the problems, but at least that movement of management is in that direction. So the focus is not only on the protected areas, but also on the buffer zone and the areas um, that connect to tiger habitats, which are called corridors. Um, that and uh, of course, incentives for communities, um, the State Board of Wildlife, the National Board of Wildlife, the NTCA, these are governing bodies, uh, you know, housed within the government that also has scientists and NGOs as members. So these bodies also meet uh, regularly to uh, discuss the welfare of wildlife and also chart out uh, plans for the future. They also look at the, the clearances of uh, uh, developmental projects. So if the project is impinging upon a tiger habitat, then these bodies can have the power to uh, to stall them. So India is using several mechanisms there. Or they also uh, have we also have a linear infrastructure guideline now that every developmental uh, linear project has to follow. Which means if uh, if any of these linear infrastructures like power line, canals, railways, roads are cutting through corridor, then there have to be mitigation measures so that animal movement is not hampered. So there are many, many such small and big uh, initiatives that they've taken. I'm not saying that uh, uh, this will uh, work in the future as well, but at least good steps have been taken and we will have to have a very adaptive management uh, strategy, which means that as we move ahead in time, these management strategies will have to adapt to it. And climate change being a biggest challenge today to mankind is throwing many, many more issues uh, of conservation uh, and those will have to also be tackled, which means the government will have to be on their toes. I would say the more inclusion of local communities in these uh, governing bodies will help. Um, involvement of scientific NGOs will help. Uh, involvement of uh, local MLAs also because the, a lot of these conservation issues are blown out of proportion because of political reasons. And so we need to uh, involve these constituencies also in a dialogue so that everybody works in an integrated fashion. Currently, uh, the, the, the NTCA and the Ministry of uh, Forest and Wildlife and Climate Change, they, uh, they obviously their mandate is to protect ecosystems. However, other ministries have mandates to uh, probably if it's a uh, the energy ministry, then they have to make sure that there is more electricity. Irrigation will talk of more dams, therefore more canal systems. Transportation will talk of more roads. So we'll have to have an integrated approach and NTCA is taking all the measures to see how uh, these ministries can be roped in so that uh, there is a landscape level integrated management plan for, uh, for development, which takes into consideration uh, conservation of ecosystems as well. And tiger is uh, just one of the many species that exists in those ecosystems. You mentioned linear infrastructure earlier. So one of WCT's most prominent projects was a wildlife underpass on a few stretches of the NH44 near French Tiger Reserve. So uh, what impact has this project had and how successful was it? Yeah, so there were several organizations that were involved. Uh, WII had done the initial uh, studies to uh, and recommended the 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 underpasses obviously the government uh, were not happy because they had recommended large underpasses and the government was uh, not willing to build them because it was going to put a lot of financial burden uh, wct had uh, simultaneously been working in that landscape 
we were estimating tiger densities not only inside pench maharashtra but madhya pradesh but also in the corridor so we had a lot of quality information on animal movement densities of tigers and other species um, and when all of it was put together it became very clear that the highway uh, the two lane highway back then before being widened was itself at that point acting as a barrier hardly any females were actually crossing some males will were crossing once in a while but very very few females were crossing and so there were any anyways the highway was isolating uh, the population in the tiger reserve from the corridor um, so that uh, 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 presentation that with the cape to the ministry um, uh, made a very big difference and and we also uh, because of the quality of information and data we had we could uh, suggest the exact location where underpasses could come in fact one of the underpasses was going to be 3 kilometers from our uh, retail camera trapping work we suggested that you don't need a 3 kilometer even a 1.4 kilometer underpass would uh, do the job so because of our scientific inputs in fact the government could even save some money and that money was then invested on building some more uh, underpasses so uh, when you work with quality data when you work uh, with uh, the forest department uh, i have seen and not not only this linear infrastructure work but also in several other projects that we do because we uh, are guided by quality science it is very easy to convince the policy makers about the issues that we decipher on the ground when somebody goes and says you know out of passion that a area needs to be protected or a highway needs to be stopped or an underpass needs to be made um, it is not taken seriously because it's not backed by data but wct's work has always been uh, to really go and collect large amounts of uh, quality data on the ground and once you have that that's the most uh, that's the biggest uh, i would say Uh, a weapon that you have in your hand and 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 i have always seen that the governments and uh, senior officers of the forest department are willing to sit across a table uh, and and listen to organizations that can provide a proof of what they are saying and uh, so linear infrastructure is a fantastic fascinating uh, field and i think going forward india will have to uh, look at Pro, pro, the provisioning conservation budgets to all linear infrastructure projects so that they don't run out of money so when they plan the project during the planning stage itself uh, research should be used as in uh, information about expansion or widening of any linear infrastructure should be shared with uh, different agencies and uh, uh, there has to be good data collection before the highway is designed and so all the designs of future infrastructure should be done after a report has been submitted by an organization like us or any other organization who is collecting data out there in that case they will be able to uh, you know have these highways completed faster which means there will be no delay because of litigation Uh, and and there will be a win win for both wildlife and uh, development because i think india does need to develop there are so many million people who don't receive uh, the basic facilities that you and i enjoy in a city and so india does need to develop but that development should take into consideration the welfare of wild animals and ecosystems so i think yes linear infrastructure is a great great uh, the the mitigation of linear infrastructure is a great project that uh, we would encourage more and more organizations to to be part of so one more of wcd's project is the human wildlife interface management so what is wcd doing in this field so interface management is simply put uh, again collecting quality data to be able to uh, predict where future hot spots are going to be so today an area may look safe but through research we know that that area is getting degraded or the population of tigers in that area is going up because government has built lot of water bodies and because of water bodies there is prey 
as because of prey the tigers are moving into that area and suddenly the tiger population uh, we can predict is going to go up and then of course if the tiger population goes up then they will need food and if there is not enough wild prey available they will go for cattle and so uh, research when you do long term research in a landscape you are able to predict problems and so linear so our interface management uh, work is about uh, giving a warning signal to the uh, forest department uh, so that they can take corrective measures before uh, a situation gets out of hand we also have uh, dedicated uh, vets uh, veterinary doctors uh, who are working very closely with forest department to tranquilize tigers when wherever there is a, a tiger that strays into a human habitat and it creates chaos out there and then wct uh, vet actually goes along with the forest department uh, and uh, tries to secure the animal safely without any injury to people um, and that animal is then fitted with radio collars we do provide radio collars to the forest department uh, on request and then that animal is rehabilitated in an ideal habitat far away from human habitation and then monitored for the next 6 7 8 months till we are sure that the animal has got stabilized and it's not moving close to human habitat often times tigers that are habituated to people don't like to be in the forest and they would always at the least excuse find an excuse to move towards the village and so such rehabilitated animals have to be observed till they stabilize in a low density human habitat or a good forest area so that again we do plus we are also called regularly to on the post mortems if a dead animal like a tiger or a leopard or a other such wild species are found then our team members are called um, to be part of the post mortem committee so that uh, you know this is again mandated by the government so that there is always a non governmental ngo representation during the post mortem so that uh, data is not suppressed so that again we do plus uh, another very interesting project that wct does is to uh, monitor the the transmission of disease from um livestock that is cattle uh, sheep goat etc to wild herbivores um, there are several diseases that are carried by these uh, livestock and when the livestock goes into the forest for grazing because in a lot of parks in india cattle is left for free grazing inside protected areas that's the area where they come in direct contact with herbivores diseases like uh, foot and mouth disease can get uh, you know uh, that can jump from livestock uh, from livestock to a species like gaur which is the largest wild cattle and gaur populations can get wiped off uh, creating a void as far as uh, prey is concerned and then the conflict will go up with carnivores so uh, we are trying to work again with the animal husbandry department and the forest department so it's a tripartite kind of a project where we are ensuring that the immunization pro- process is fine tuned that uh, the livestock especially cattle cows and buffaloes are Uh, im- immunized through inoculation at the right time, um, and then we monitor the interface between wild and um, uh, domestic animals to see the rate of transfer. And we are now going to soon cover the entire state of Madhya Pradesh. We have had we have been doing work since the last four years in Sanjay Dubri Tiger Reserve and Ban- Bandhavgarh. And from the learnings in the next couple of years, we are going to actually uh, hope to make a big change in the policy at the state level and then hope to have the same kind of influence on the national level to start monitoring uh, wild populations regularly for disease the which is called, so our project is called the disease surveillance project to to do surveillance so that uh, there is no epidemic because you know what covid has done to human beings there are several such uh, diseases that can get out of control in wildlife and they can wipe out hundreds of thousands of animals um, within no time and so we can cons- we think that um, disease and um, uh, spread in uh, that is uh, you know the transfer of disease from domestic to wild 
it could be from dogs to large carnivores like feral dogs or or um, domestic dogs to uh, carnivores in the wild or it could be from domestic cattle to wild cattle disease i think has uh, is a far more bigger threat to indian wildlife then uh, poaching or habitat destruction at this point in time. I mean, habitat destruction, of course, is an overarching threat, but poaching uh, can be controlled by disease. Once it gets into the population, it can really wipe out a huge number of species in, in, in a particular forest. So we do, uh, we will continue to work on them and we will encourage other organizations build capacity in the government institutions uh, so that uh, it becomes part of the policy. So my final question for you is that how can an individual contribute to WCD and tiger conservation as a whole? Uh, individuals have a big role to play. I think uh, organizations like ours uh, obviously are run by smart people who come from the society. There are a lot of, uh, so and my team is about 85 people. They were all self-motivated people who, as we, as they were growing, they wanted to contribute something. And uh, WCT has shown that you don't really um, have to focus only on zoologists or botanists to do conservation. Okay. You can also uh, include in your team people from uh, you know several backgrounds. Uh, WCT we have at WCT we have people from. Uh, conservation biology from zoology, uh, which is a traditional field associated with conservation. But in addition to that, we have MBBS doctors who are working with communities and forest department staff to see uh, they're car car carrying out health projects. Then we have economists who are working with communities to understand social economics. We are also uh, having social psychologists who are understanding behavior of people and what can be done to change it in favor of the environment. We have lawyers uh, who are drafting policies, who are helping uh, in, in the law enforcement vertical that we have. We have forensic scientists who are obviously training the forest department to use indirect evidences uh, in the field to uh, make a very robust and watertight case so that convictions can be achieved in the field. Um, we do have uh, people, statistics, statisticians, um, also mathematicians. Uh, so the, we also have people who, who are working in, in the field of arts. So we have a, a field assistant who's very good in dramatics and he uses Nukkad Natak uh, and stage basically to communicate conservation messages in um, the areas that he works in. So WCT is an amalgamation of people from different fields. And so I feel that you don't have to be a zoologist or a conservation biologist to uh, work in the field of conservation. Uh, and uh, if it comes to a common man who, who doesn't have the time to uh, join an organization or uh, is already working in some other company and cannot really shift uh, the profession. Even there, uh, you could contribute by writing articles, by traveling to these areas, by volunteering uh, with um, good organizations, by volunteering in uh, tiger and prey estimation programs uh, of the government. Um, artists can utilize their art to spread awareness, painters, uh, singers, musicians can always help raise funds for uh, NGOs like ours or any other NGO for that matter. Um, they could also create jingles which can be used to spread awareness. Uh, people interested in media, of course, can do many things, work for a television channel, uh, uh, you know, work, uh, make movies, make documentaries. Lawyers can devote some, maybe 5-10% of their time in fighting cases at uh, um, for the government uh, because uh, oftentimes the offenders has, because of the money they have, especially in uh, wildlife trade, they will be able to hire uh, far better lawyers, whereas the government will not have that kind of quality lawyers or the money to pay. And in that situation, if good quality lawyers can come forward and uh, offer their services for 
negligible amounts that will have a big impact on conviction rates if the conviction rates go up then uh, the poaching incidences and other environment related uh, you know uh, uh, the negative influences on environment can go down so i would say writers can write in the newspapers there are a lot of books that people can write they can write uh, wildlife uh, they can come up with interesting um, books for children because children need to be children need to be exposed to conservation messages very early in life and so people interested in you know artists can create a good uh, interesting book now even uh, social media there is so much that people can do uh, blogs vlogs so there are so many people who are doing uh, blogs or vlogs on uh, uh, real life issues they could start looking at environment uh, space and and do those programs because they are very popular and these are influencers that can really change the way people look at wildlife finally uh, if you are interested in politics that also helps uh, because politicians do have a big role and power and if you are somebody who is environmentally inclined uh, you will definitely be able to do much more um, for environment than somebody like me so and finally voters people should vote for parties that have environment and conservation as one of the top agenda items on their manifesto so um, yeah so a, a lot can be done however one one important thing that i must here add is that conservation is not just because you're passionate doesn't mean you will be able to do effective conservation it's as professional a field as surgery in fact it would it is far more complex than becoming a surgeon or becoming a, a civil engineer right or a it professional because conservation is a multi sectorial game where you are looking at ecology of wild animals you are looking at uh, ecosystems you are looking at soil you are looking at the environment you are looking at people social side you are looking at the politics of it you are looking at the law you are looking at policy so it's a very very complex field and therefore just passion won't help so you will have to take bridge courses you will have to do online uh, maybe degrees wherever you have time part time to improve your understanding and then because most people call me say you know i am an it professional i want to do something for wildlife i love wildlife so i cannot say the same when i say oh, oh i want to become a surgeon and i want to save lives so can i become a surgeon allow me inside the operation theater so it's not as simple so we people who are passionate should back it with some amount of um, understanding through uh, online or join organizations like bombay natural history society read sanctuary asia magazine um because they are mouthpieces of wildlife and they can then uh, after improving their understanding they will themselves know what they can do for environment and uh, because i don't know these millions of people who may may eventually listen to me uh, and so it's very difficult for me to tell them what they should do but i am giving you your road map and if all of the people who are interested follow this road map then they themselves will know what they can do with the kind of time and resources they have at, at hand thank you that that's a very nice answer so that's my final question it was nice speaking with you pleasure pleasure i hope you enjoyed the second episode of the think wildlife podcast season 2 so before you go don't forget that you can help contribute to the local communities directly living inside indus forests there are over 200 million people who depend on these forests for sustenance in the form of uh, bush meat medicine um for grazing and fuel wood obviously having a major impact on the forests so we at think wildlife foundation have partnered with various organizations in india to help upscale sustainable alternative livelihood projects which not only incentivize conservation but also help some of the poorest communities of india check the links below for how you can contribute to these projects